So uh, get on that website and check it out, the Tennessee General Assembly website. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> beautiful time this morning uh, to come and to worship the Lord. Uh, and if you think about what we sing during these songs, uh, Sister Joy so beautifully sang to stand still. Uh, stand still, wait upon the Lord, which is totally contrary to our instincts. Um, your love defends us. You are the strength of my soul. Um, that uh, though there's uncertainty, you're our rock. And I'm telling you, folks, if I better get away from that, I'm telling you, the Lord is blessed when we sing those things from the heart and when we meet, mean them, of course. But what a praise. What, a, what an adoration. Besides just, uh, hey, Lord, uh, can you give me some stuff or help me out of this jam? And we do that too. But just to adore him and just say that how he truly meets that need, that deep need that's within us. Because we know that there is a lot more to us than just flesh and blood. You know, we've got our arms, our legs, our nice haircuts, our lack of hair, uh, whatever's going on. We've got our minds, we've got, uh, uh, we've got our emotions, but deep within there is the heart or the soul or the spirit of man. And that is what is eternal. That is God breathed and it will be there forever. And that is what is most important to you, whether you realize it or not. But these days... Uh, uh, to quote someone, uh, we are living in a material world and I am a, you guys know it too, material girl. Okay, so I'm not a material girl, I'm a material guy. But you get the picture. I mean, that's where it has been uh, for the past de decades. It's all about getting what you can acquire. Why? Because there is no hereafter. There's no eternity. So live like live today as best you can and acquire as much as you can because tomorrow we're not going to be here. But that mentality is not in the heart of the Christian. We realize, we know that there is more to that. Um, and, and it's something that is, uh, it's very weak too. We see that in the lives of the rich and famous. They have all that stuff that we try to uh, get and uh, acquire and have, but yet you could still see desperation. You see suicide and drug abuse and all these things. I have friends in Florida that um, have become acquainted with two folks. Uh, they live in Winter Park, which is like, you need big money to live there in Florida. Um, I understand they're worth about 25 million bucks. And, uh, and, and I don't, I'm not picking on these people. I, I, don't, I don't know them. I don't know what's going on exactly. But it's just that their lifestyle just seems so uh, distraught and, and hurting. Um, the, 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 the woman in the marriage has spent, um, just from my conversations, probably in the past two months, about 55 grand just on getting uh, things added on and things sucked out and faces twisted around all those all those kind of things and now there's anything wrong with that but I, but it's just that's just a lot of money to put into that and and the husband uh, and and the wife live in the house and and they're upstairs most of the time while their four-year-old child is downstairs the whole day with a babysitter and they have someone that cleans the house and someone that manages the house and, it, and as I hear this, they've, they've got the, the nice home and the beautiful cars and the beautiful area, and they probably look good too, <clears throat> even if you don't with all that work, it, could, it helps out. So, uh, <laughs> um, but still you could just see a hunger and a despair there. The soul is not satisfied in those cases. Why? Because it is a spiritual entity and it can only be satisfied by the Lord. And I would encourage you this morning, and I'm not going to stay on this subject, but I would encourage you, remember that the stuff isn't going to last. Try to focus on heavenly, eternal things. Uh, they're going to be there. Because you, you just can't, when we sing these songs, and, and I could tell that's where our heart is when we sing of these things of the Lord. It's not about this stuff, but we got to watch because it's, so, it's so much out there. It's so easy to be uh, wrapped up in things. Um, 
And it's interesting that even, um, even the world realizes this idea that we have, there's something deeper than, than just flesh and blood. Even uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, you know, the author of the psychoanalytic ther uh, theory, he proposed that the consciousness of man was made up in the id, anybody remember this? I see a couple of people nodding, the id, the ego, and the superego. Not that he, uh, is, it actually makes sense though, uh, and, and he was an atheist, but basically the id was just that basic instinct of man. I want to eat, I want to drink, I want to have sex, I want my needs met, I want shelter, and you do anything you can to get it. But it was balanced by the ego, and the ego kind of had a social consciousness, like, um, Okay, so uh, I'm thirsty, and uh, Trish has a drink, but I'm not just going to go and take it from her because there are sanctions against that. So you had that balance there, you know? Um, but even beyond that, the superego was this moral consciousness that people had. And again, he wasn't a believer, but there was something even higher than that that dictated man's behavior. So it was interesting that even in the world, this idea is out there. Now, man's moral code, man does have a morality of sense. Because if you remember, in the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I'm telling you, out there in the world today is an attempt for goodness. Uh, whether they're interested in trying to please God or not, there's an attempt at goodness. Um, and, and we see this. Um, I remember when I, when I lived down in Florida, uh, there was a girl that I worked with, and she was from uh, New England. She moved down to Florida, and, uh, and she drove a Prius, a little Toyota Prius. And, uh, and, and she was getting, getting on me because I was one of those people who was leaving a carbon footprint and uh, gobbling up all the world's gas driving my minivan. And I, you know, I'd be like, geez, Deb. I says, you know, I got three kids and I, I got diaper bags and carriages. I just can't fit in a Prius, you know. But there was a goodness that she felt, well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm better than you because I drive a better car and I'm not going to leave a carbon footprint and I'm more conscious of the environment. There's that, that, that goodness that comes from there. And a lot of, and you see this a lot in the political arena too where, um, oh, <clears throat> we're not like those, those mean fundamental Christians who don't want to let anybody in here that's illegal. Oh, we just want to let everybody in because we're so loving and we're so kind, we're better than they are. When the Christians are saying, well, that's fine if folks want to come in, but let's find out who they are first. You know, that's pretty real. Let's protect the citizens we, citizens we have. Um, abortion. Well, we stand for women's rights, and we're not going to squash the rights of a woman to make a choice like those rotten Christians, those conservative Christians. And, of course, the Christians are saying, yeah, but you're snuffing out a, a life for that right, and that's wrong. So you can see there's a morality that's out there in the world. And this, um, this morality sneaks into the church as well. You could see it, uh, you know, even, even just recently, kind of, uh, I don't know, our pastor kind of alluded to it, like, you know, we had some snow days and things, so we, we canceled, because some folks, they're going to get here no matter what, we don't want anybody to be in danger. But a lot of people would say, oh, we never cancel our services due to bad weather. <laughs> That's for those weaker congregations that don't believe in God's blessing and protection as they get to, you know, I'm, again, you could, you could see that. We definitely see it with the King James Bible. Oh, no, no, we only read the King James. Thou shalt only read the King James, and thee shall bring it with you when thou comest to church, even if it's snowing out. You know, I mean, there's just, and, and again, there's that, that snobbery, or the way, the way we dress, or the music. Oh, please, we don't, we don't believe in these drum sets and these electric guitar riffs in the middle of Amazing Grace. We're the more spiritual. We're the better sort. You could see this stuff in the church. And it's interesting, too. Uh, Tracy, I don't know she's here. She was teaching this morning about Jonah in Sunday school. And <clears throat> you could see where, where, I mean, the Jews were a bit snooty. They, they were. 
they didn't, they didn't like the Samaritans. They didn't like the Chaldeans. They were against the Romans. There was kind of a, you could almost tell, like, you know, as God's people, they were kind of entitled. And we certainly see this with Jonah. Because God is telling Jonah, go to the Ninevites and preach to them. Otherwise, they're going to wipe them out. And you need to warn them. And Jonah's feeling was, <laughs> yeah, good, go get them. He's, I mean, he literally, I mean, he went on the boat, got swallowed by the whale, was sitting under the tree, the whole, you guys know the story, the whole nine yards. He's just like, I don't want these people saved. They're beneath me. They're so sinful and ugh. I'm not going to preach to them. And you could see that, just that religious snootiness, this goodness. And that is not what the Lord wants in the church. If you've got your Bibles, if you could open it up um, to Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew 5, verse 20. And this is a common one. I mean, you're familiar with it. Jesus is, is teaching and he says, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom. He wants more than this self-righteousness, more than this moral compass that we have. He wants more than that. In Matthew chapter 6, let me read that one, verse 1 and 2. Matthew 6, verse 1 and 2. He says, Take heed, watch out, that you do not do your charitable de deeds before men. i got to put the glasses on. Oh, Jeez. Uh, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet before as, you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. As surely I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know the, what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be seen in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Very interesting. And this is a practice that went on. You know, you got the tambourine going and you're putting your tithe in the air and everybody, oh boy, look at, look at uh, Pharisee so-and-so. Boy, he's really put a lot in there today. And, you know, you, 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 we do things, uh, we say it's for God, but it's really for man to see. Why? Because we look better. It's just, it's just the way it works. At the heart of that is really pride. You want to do your good things, because good is good, especially in the church, but you want people to know about it. And that's the Christ is saying, nah, -uh. you do it in secret. Don't let anybody know. Just do it in secret. And your father who sees in secret, don't you love that he sees in secret? There are things that you do, that you think, that you worry about, where you witness, where you help, where you bless, Nobody cares, nobody knows, but he knows. He, I, I would love to know what, when um, Philip brings Nathaniel to Jesus uh, as, as a disciple, and Jesus says to him, he says, Nathaniel, he, remember he says, he says, you, you, one with no guile in your mouth, he said, I saw you underneath the, anybody remember what kind of tree it was? That nah, doesn't matter. But he says, I saw you underneath the tree. The scripture tells us nothing else about it. We have no idea. But there was something going on personally that uh, Nathan was dealing with and Jesus saw it. God sees. He sees the struggles. He sees the hurts and he sees the good things that we do. So hang in there. Keep serving him. But that's what Jesus wants. He wants us to have that love. So in Jonah's case, Sure, he, took the, he had the moral upright hand. Yes, they were sinners. Okay, we got that. He could probably read down the commandments and say they're not doing this, they're not doing that, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. But Jesus is saying, God is saying, you love them anyway. Go and warn them, otherwise they're going to be destroyed. Jonah says, no, no, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. That's it. But you can see that is the heart of God and that's what he wants to deal. He wants our soul to have that kind of love, that kind of meekness, that kind of gentleness. Um, and he'll reward us uh, openly. You know, there's another point I just wanted to uh, share about Jonah. And I, I really was listening, Tracy, if you're here. Um, 
you think with Jonah, he, he leaves Nineveh on a boat for Tarshish, completely disobeying what God told him to do, right? He gets on the boat, the Lord brings a storm, and they end up throwing, they cast lots, they throw them overboard, the seas calms. But it says that those guys on the boat, they're not even Christian, they're not Jewish, they, they don't know God, but it says they end up bowing before God and honoring Jonah's God. Because they ask him, who's your God? He says, I'm a Hebrew, it's, it's, it's God of the land and seas. So here you have like this conversion of sense on the boat, then he goes to Nineveh, preaches to them, they all repent, so you have this whole city that's saved, and no, uh, Jonah is still upset about it, still wants to die, still complaining and, and upset. It amazes me how effective God can be in our imperfections. And I am, don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you not to obey God. Obedience is the best way to go. Do what he says. Follow his word. That will be the best. But I'm telling you, when you screw up, don't think it's over. Do not think it's over. God will still use you. Jonah, Jonah, yeah, Jonah, there you go. Uh, Jonah messed up several times in this thing. His heart wasn't in it. God had to forcibly bring him to Nineveh in a fish. He got his will done. God's will is going to happen. Be a part of it. Don't think it's over just because you're screwing up. Hang in there. It's not about your faithfulness. It'll never work then. It's about his. I'm going to tell you one quick story. And again, this is, it's a little edgy. And please don't misunderstand me. Just, but to, to make a point, I've got, I have a good buddy up, uh, up north. And he always struggled uh, his whole life with porn, strip clubs, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he, he loved the Lord. He, he, he administered in church. I knew he had a good sense of the gospel. And he went out one night, he, he just blew it. Whatever it was, he was upset. He got to drinking. Nothing was worth it. His life was over. His wife was upset. He gave up. And he goes to a strip club. And he's sitting there at this strip club. And one of the girls come over and start, uh, starts talking to him. And you know, he actually, and he was drinking too. He starts telling this girl about Christ. Now, I'm not recommending, recommending this to anyone. Do not tell pastor that I'm talking about, I recommend you go to strip clubs. I am not. He, he'll be back like in 30 minutes. So don't, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that at our worst, there, he still, he has a plan. That girl had to hear and it happened. And he said there were tears coming down her, down her face as he's just sharing. He's, he's being honest with her. He says, I'm a screw up. I'm away from God, but I know God loves me. I know he has a plan for me. I mess it up. I mess it up now. I shouldn't be here. He was honest with her. And something inside her, it just, it just touched her. And she began to cry. I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's amazing. It really is amazing. So don't, you don't have to rely on, on your perfection because it's not there. But keep hanging in there. Keep seeking him. Keep loving him. I'm telling you, he is faithful. And his word will go out. His will will be done through you. And we think about it. Here we have Jesus, God incarnate, comes to the earth. He walks upon the earth perfectly heals, teaches, ministers, and he leaves, right? He left. He went back to the Father. But thank God he left the Holy Spirit, amen? Because the Holy Spirit now could go and minister to people, could evangelize. The Holy Spirit could be the representation of him on earth, amen? Wrong! That's wrong. The Holy Spirit has come as a comforter to assist us, but we are him. He left, now we're here in his place. We are to represent him. We're to continue to do what, what he did, to minister, to help, to heal, to encourage. That's what we're here for. You know, some people think it's always the Spirit. Oh, well, the Spirit didn't lead me to tithe this month. Well, the Spirit didn't lead me to, uh, to uh, 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 minister to that person. Well, the Lord didn't touch me that I should uh, give or help that person out. A lot of that's baloney. 
That's what we're here for. Yes, the Spirit will guide us and help us, and it's always in accordance with the Word of God. But that's what we're here for. We're to be his hands, his feet. We're Jesus now. He's gone. We're here. If you, if you go out there and you say, hey, you want to know about Jesus? How are they going to find out? It's primarily you. I hope they read the word. I, and they'll see Christ in there too. Yes, amen. But they're going to get a darn good idea what Christ is like by looking at you. And if we mess up, whoo, they just got, they have no example. That's us. That's our job. Amen. This sanctification process, this idea, or not this idea, this plan of God to incorporate his likeness into us, it's not, it's not behavior modification either. You know, behavior, everybody remember Ivan Pavlov um, with the dogs? Uh, he was like the founder of this idea. Basically, the, here the, the dog comes out, uh, the dog's hungry, they, they ring a bell and they show the dog a hamburger. Well, the dog salivates because it's hungry, it sees a hamburger. And they keep doing this, ring the bell, show the hamburger, ring the bell, show the hamburger. And, and it got to the point where the dog would actually salivate just at the ringing of the bell because it learned that the hamburger was coming next. It was like behavior modification. So you could, you could alter people's actions based on rewards and punishments. We used to do, I used to work in a group home uh, years ago for uh, mentally ill folks. And excuse me, in order trying to get them to do their activities of daily living, to do their, uh, you know, clean up after themselves, to do their chores and stuff like that, they would come in and I would review with them. Well, did you, did you clean the toilet? Oh, okay, good, you check. And uh, did, you, did you brush your teeth today? Yes, check. You know, and they'd go through it. Um, I had this one lady, Sophie, uh, I, I, could just, I could still see her. She'd come down in the morning, Scott. I washed under my arms. I brushed my teeth. I cleaned my room. You know, she would like go through the whole thing for me because she knew I was going to ask her that. And that's good that you can modify the behavior like that. And, and, and I, think it's, I think it's effective. But God wants the heart. He wants you to change, the soul to change, so that the behavior is different. It's different. They're not just, you know, making you change. Because what Sophie could do, Sophie could come down, she could reach into the dirty toilet, get a rag, get some toilet water, and go and wipe off the kitchen table with it. Yep, clean it all up. And she'd come down and say, Sophie, did you clean the kitchen table? Yes. She did it. She did it. I modified her behavior, but I haven't got to her heart at all. And I'm telling you, in the church, we behave the same way a lot. We've got the actions down. We got the niceties, the hey, brother, the, the hallelujah hugs. But yet, we're bad-mouthing and cutting people up when they're not around. We got to watch. We got to watch. We talk love. We dress nice. We're smiling. But then we're, we don't want, then somebody has a need. No, we don't want to, we don't want to fool with them. We don't have time for that. So we got to watch. It's more than just the outward. God wants, he doesn't want that. He doesn't care if the outside of that cup is shiny. He wants the inside. That, that's what he wants. He wants that soul to change, to be reflective of who he is. If, if you have your Bibles, uh, 1 Peter, if you could open up to 1 Peter. I think Steve even touched on some of this uh, when he spoke on Wednesday. 1 Peter chapter 2. Oh, here goes the glasses again. Boy, I'll tell you, these, it's, it's ridiculous. I, I used to be able to see uh, close up well. I've always had glasses for distance since I was in kindergarten. Now I can't see either. So it, it, it's ridiculous. Like I can't see, I tried to have like one pair of glasses to see Stephanie out there, and then I would need another pair to read. I tried the both bifocals, and I'm, oh my gosh, I'm like in a spaceship. Every time I tilt my head, my vision changes. I'm like... <laughs> And then they, up in Jamestown, they had me trying like to wear one contact and one eye and another contact. It takes me like 40 minutes to put the uh, contacts in. I think my eyes are too small. And I, oh, it's, it's just been such a battle. I'm, I'm, oh, it's crazy. So if you see me wrestling up here, that's why. Okay, so 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 11. 
Uh, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, that they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So again, we've got to abstain from these lusts. And, and again, they're not always sinful lusts, just are always our needs, our needs. Lord, help me to eat. Lord, help me to look better. Lord, help me to be taller. Lord, help me to be nicer. Lord, just everything. You know, help me to get a new car. Help my old car to run better. Always with the needs. But sometimes we, some of these things, we just have to learn to put them in their proper place. Not that we can't have them. There's nothing wrong with those things, you know, those things I mentioned. But they need a place, and the things of God need to be first. Remember, seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be taken care of, but keep him first. Um, and when we do that, when there's, when there's, when the evildoers come against us, they'll have a witness. They'll, they'll say, yeah, you know, I'm, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily, uh, believe Irv's politics. You know, he's, you know, kind of loud him out there and, you know, saying, give his opinion all the time. But I'll tell you what, man, he really loves his wife, man. I, I've seen that guy in action. He takes good care of Fran, buys her a new camera every month. You know, real, just, just takes good care of her. You know, these, these, these things, the hearts change. So you, you're, you're a witness to, to people, the evildoers. They, they may have something bad, but when it comes down to it, they see that you're real, you're authentic. You love people, you love God, you're faithful. Let, let them be seen. Let that witness of Christ be in us. If you could go over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to start with verse 24, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. So he's saying, he's not even saying that there's just one prize. I don't think, oh, everybody's going to run for this prize. There's one crown. I'm not going to get one because Linda is so much more spiritual than I am. That, that's not it. He's saying, run as if there's one prize. You've, you're competing. There's, some, there's an urgency there. Don't just meander through your Christian walk. Yeah. Well, I'll go to church today and, uh, you know, hopefully pastor doesn't preach too long. And, and uh, well, you know, I put a dollar in at the roadblock there because Ashley was out waving a sign for the cheerleaders. So, you know, I did my goodness there. And, you know, well, I'm, um, you know, I, I, I could watch that movie even though it's filled with foul language and nudity, but no one will know. I'll still look good on Sunday morning. No one's going to care. Not going to make any difference to Brandon. No, no, no. Don't, don't like try to take your walk like that. That's not a race. There's no urgency. There's no, there's no putting your heart and soul into it. We need that. We need to. It's important. It's important. Amen. Let me keep reading here. Um, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. In other words, they're disciplined. And we see this discipline. You see it in sports. You see it in people that that have business. There's a discipline required for things in the flesh. By all means, it's required for spiritual things. There's a temperance, a discipline. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for an imperishable crown. Amen. Therefore, I run thus... This is Paul saying, so this is how I run. Not with uncertainty. He's not doubting. Is it even worth it? I don't know. I'm going to go to Ephesus. I'm talking to the Corinthians. They don't like me. Nobody cares. I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. I'm watching Fox News. I'm depressed about everything going on. Nothing seems to change. I don't know if this Jesus stuff is real. Nobody likes me. I still have no money. I've been a Christian for five years. You know, now don't be uncertain about these things. I promise you, he is there and it's important and he loves you. And there is a purpose and a plan for everything you're doing. Have, don't be uncertain about these things. And Paul says, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. 
He's just out wailing around. You know, I'd be like, like me fighting Bruce. Bruce just holds his arm out like this with my head against so him. He's wailing around like this. No, this is a fight. You're connecting. You're, 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 you're helping the kingdom. You're defeating the evil kingdom. It's a fight. It's a worthy cause. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself uh, should become disqualified. In other words, he's saying, I've got to do this because when I'm preaching out there, if I'm not living that life, it's not going to mean anything to them. And he uses the word, I discipline my body. But if I'm not mistaken, the King James, or maybe in other verses, uh, he uses stronger language. He talks about beating his body. You know, just, just, just beating it. The verbiage is stronger. In other passages, it refers to the flesh dying, that the flesh must die. Um, if, he, if he was in the, if Paul wasn't Jewish, if he was Italian and in the mafia, it'd be kind of more like, eh, yeah, I've been hearing about this stuff with your flesh. You're having some battles. I tell you what I want. I want it dead. You understand me? I want it dead. That's what he's saying. Just flesh has to die. No room for it. Make room for the Spirit of God. Amen. Um, so we, we want this to grow in Christ. We want to grow up in Him. Uh, and I'll tell you that. The only way, and I've been a Christian now for a long time. I was about 11 when I was saved. And I, I, I don't see any other way to allow that flesh to die and that spirit man to grow as it's intertwined with Christ other than planned devotion to Him. I think you've got to set time apart. Now, I'm not going to tell you if it needs to be an hour or 20 minutes, but set time apart, preferably in the morning, to read something of him and seek him. It's got to be scheduled. I'm telling you, it's just got to be scheduled. Things We don't do things if they're not intentional and planned often. So, so make that commitment. Church attendance, you've got to be with the, the brothers and the sisters. You've got to hear the teaching. You've got to, you've got to talk to uh, your brothers and sisters about their struggles and let them hear, hear yours. Confess your sins one to another. Man, without that, you, you just can't be an island in this thing. You've got to have fellowship. <clears throat> um, and just constantly being in prayer. Not that you're just going to sit in your closet all day and pray all day. If you could, that's That's good. But on the way to work, you know, it, it, when you have a break at work, just have the Lord in your mind and talk to Him. Uh, Christian music, always something good. They just hear that edification. These things will build up that spirit man and allow that fleshly part with all its desires to die off. You've got to feed it. You say you got to feed a cold. You got to feed your spirit. You got to keep that fed. Um, Amen. Let me just see where I am on time. All right, I just want to point out one more thing. We, we have this idea that the church is on the defense. Amen, because the world continues to come against her. And, and you know, with all the, we see the things are in our neighborhoods, from the politics, all those things going on. And we always hear that verse that the, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And we think of that as a defensive uh, mechanism. I remember, I think it was Mark that preached about this a couple years ago. But we have that backwards. What they're portraying in that verse is that the world, the enemy, is on the defense. And the gate that he protects himself with will not prevail when the church comes against him. Okay, so that the church is more offensive in both ways. First of all, it's not defense, it's on the offense. The church is moving and proclaiming the good news in the world. But it's also offensive in the sense that what you have to say, the world does not like it. So when we see all this turmoil between the Christian world and the non-Christian world, I think it's our fault. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Why? Because the world wants to sit in its depravity. They've got, you know, uh, 
want to tax people to death and they want abortion and they want to sleep with whoever they want. They want to use bad language and be involved in, in uh, crooked politics and, and, and tyranny and all these things. But they're happy with it. It's, they're miserable. They're in need of help, but they're contented to sit in that stuff. And when the Lord sends the prophet and says, you're wrong, Nineveh, I'm going to destroy you. Uh, when the prophet proclaims the truth of God, it is an offense to them. When he sent Christ preaching a true gospel, not this outside the cuff, uh, outside of the cup stuff like the Pharisees were pushing, it was an offense to them that truth comes and it cuts and it hurts. When he sends you to go into the office and start talking about Jesus, Brandon is only upsetting people. I heard he had a conversation with someone who insisted it was perfectly okay. You get saved and that's all you got to do. My life should not change one iota. I am fine. And then Brandon's got to sit there during his lunch and be telling him that that's not true, man. Jesus has more for you than that. That is an offense. You Christians stir people up. And you should. But it's got to be done in a loving way. Don't go out there blabbering, just trying to show you're right and to put people in their place. That you, you don't see that in the life of Christ. You, you don't even, it, Paul is forceful as he is. You don't even see it with him. There's truth is always mingled with love. Your intention needs to be to help that person see, to make them better, to love them, not to put them in their place. So we got to watch on Facebook. We got to watch in the lunchroom. We got to be careful. Our heart has to be right. Our intention toward that person has got to be love, and then you give that truth. Amen? We're not here to beat anybody up. Amen? Amen. All right. Okay, so... Think about what we talked about. Just let the Lord deal with in these things. Uh, seek Him, love Him, and I'll tell you, he'll, he'll meet that need right where you're at. He'll be there. That, that deep, deep need that we have in our soul, is only, it's only something he can, he can meet. Amen. So I'm letting you go a little late, late but it's way earlier than Pastor would have. So I, I, don't, I don't feel too bad. Um, but uh, Leslie's going to close us out in prayer, and I, I hope you guys have a wonderful week.